Gracious. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus wanted to disclose his calling, uh, more of his identity, uh, his ministry while he was in Nazareth, uh, he went into the synagogue. As was custom, he took the scroll of Isaiah, he found that place in Isaiah where we read these words and he spoke them forth. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives. It's Isaiah uh, chapter 61. And in that chapter, just about one or two verses after the words that Jesus cite, we read these words. They shall build up the ancient ruin. They shall raise up the former devastation. They shall repair the ruined cities. That word, ruins or ruin, is a helpful and important one as we begin this morning a new series in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah's ruin. Uh, you can travel all around uh, the world today and see the ruins of many ancient cities. Petra, in Jordan, the Acropolis in Athens, Ephesus, uh, in Turkey, in many more places. Cities, uh, civilizations that once flourished, uh, teeming with life economically, socially, politically, spiritually, in various ways, uh, but now in ruins. A picture of something that once was. Now simply for uh, tours to be looked upon, to be studied. And we know that's how, in some ways, history un we, we accept that. But if you are a member of the covenant community of the Lord, living in Zechariah's day, the 6th century B.C., there's a place that lay in ruins that God is calling to be restored, to be built up again, a home to be built, a home to be reestablished for the dwelling of God himself. And yet we know the rebuilding really begins with the heart of God's people, the people themselves. So if you turn to the book of Zechariah, Toward the very end of the Old Testament, one way to easily get there is to turn to the New Testament book of Matthew and flip back a few pages. Zechariah chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Let's give our attention to God's word. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Edu, saying, The Lord was very angry with your father. Therefore, say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophet cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my servants, my statue, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your father? So they repented and said, As the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so has he dealt with us. It can't be emphasized enough the centrality of the temple in the life of Israel. This was the place designed by God, the place where God promised to make his special. Uh, presence known, the place where sacrifice and atonement for sin took place, the place where mutual faith and worship was to be enjoyed. Um, our God is a God of place. But just as he chose Eden in the beginning of the creation story, placed man and woman there, a place to dwell, and from there to stretch his glory around his world, his creation, 
all the nations. So even in a fallen world, God chose a people, Israel, and he chose a place, Jerusalem. He designed a temple in which to dwell and from there to stretch his holiness and his gospel from sea uh, to sea. And yet when the people of God rebelled in the days of the prophets of Isaiah and Micah, Jeremiah, Hosea, going their own way, neglecting the poor, neglecting the commandments of God at the Sabbath day, intermix intermixing uh, with foreign and pagan nations and their practices and spirituality, in numerous ways, going their own way. As a response, God not only brought judgment through the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem, but he brought destruction to the temple in 586 BC, an important time stamp in God's unfolding redemptive history, 586 BC, the destruction of the temple. The temple, and in a way, the heart of worship would lay in ruins. But it wasn't just ruined structures. It was ruined lives. Exile would be their new reality. We know God would not be silent in exile. We consider the, the book of Daniel together. Through Daniel the prophet, through Ezekiel, God would speak to his people. And yet, while in exile, very likely the people clung to the promise that God had made, particularly promises in a book like Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, great chapter, calling the people to invest while in exile, to build houses, to have children, to seek the welfare of that city while in exile. And yet, we read in Jeremiah 29, 10, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise. I will bring you back to this place. And then those well-known words, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, peace, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Uh, the Lord is, but he is also the God of restoration. And that future time of restoration was at hand in the day and days of Zechariah. To serve the, the larger context of this book, Zechariah, Ezra 1 is a good place to go. I would encourage you to turn there. Ezra comes right after the books of Kings and then Chronicles. Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 gives us helpful context. I'll read the first few verses. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Notice the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. That year is 538 BC. 586, the temple is destroyed. Decade, now it's time for restoration and rebuilding. And so Cyrus issues this decree, 538 BC. It's the beginning of the return, the first wave of Israelites to return to Jerusalem. The year prior, 539 BC, Cyrus and the Persians had overcome and conquered Babylonia. And they thus not only became the dominant empire, the Persians, in the ancient Near East, but they acquired all of Babylon's lands, including Judea and Samaria. 
And we should note here the important application. God is so often at work in very great and powerful ways that go well beyond our individual worlds and lives. And that we are called to orient our lives around his great works, past and present. That's what the scriptures do for God's people. That's what the biblical story is to do for us, to enable us to look through a window, God's window, to see well beyond my own set of eyes. With its limited scope and often myopic kind of vision. Think about the exiles. I'm sure some of the exiles did not want to return. Having grown comfortable, moving is hard. Rebuilding is really hard. Uprooting means instability. Moving means uncertainty. But to what and where God is calling his people is greater than the condition or place in which they presently live. And that's true for you and me. Listen to these words from one late Christian scholar. He said, the church is not to be defined by what it is, but by that end to which it moves. That's true for us, individually and corporately. God is moving his people in a direction, and that direction is to give shape to us. Where God is calling us, where God is moving us, is to be what is primarily shaping us. The people needed to believe that in Zechariah's day. When you turn from Ezra 1 to Ezra chapter 2, you begin to see a list of some of those who would begin to return. And two key figures show up right away. One is Zerubbabel. He's a descendant of David. He's chosen by the Lord. And the Lord's hand will be upon him. He will eventually become governor in uh, Judah, in Judea. The other is Joshua, who is a priest. If you turn then from 2 into chapter 3, you begin to see the rebuilding efforts. And it's the first thing that they begin to rebuild. It is the altar. That sacrifice and worship would take center stage. Ezra 3, verse 1. When the seventh month came. Well, in the Hebrew calendar, the seventh month, which is why they're noting this here, is the month of the day of the Perhaps the holiest day. When redemption was commemorated and signified. And then followed by the Feast of Tabernacles. Recalling God's deliverance of his people from slavery in Egypt. And then his tabernacling with them. In the wilderness. Ezra 3 8, we read this. Now, in the second year, after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedach, made a beginning, together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests, the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. The people begin to lay them the foundation for the temple. Again, in 538 BC, but they don't make much progress. Discouragement begins to dawn the people of God right from the beginning. Because while there were shouts of joy, we read in Ezra 4 that, that it was mixed by others who were weeping. They were saddened and doubtful that this new work would compare to the former temple's glory. There were even some who had gone through the exile. They had seen Solomon's temple. They had been through exile, and some are now returning. Furthermore, there was external opposition. God's people were not only living in a Persian-controlled province, but the Persians were wanting to participate. They wanted to bring their own efforts, their own culture, their own religious views into the Jews and their real rebuilding efforts. And when the Jews refused, we're told this in Ezra 4, verse 4, the people of the land, the Persians, discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. 
bribing counselors against them, frustrating their ways all the days of Cyrus until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. We're marking a period of time of, of 20 years of frustrations, fears, troubles. From 538 to the time Zechariah is called in 520 BC. So this is where Zechariah's, I would say, quite unexpected opening comes in. The scene is one of discouragement. The people are discouraged. They're facing opposition and challenge. Yet despite this, if the people of God then or now are going to know the faithfulness of God and the reassurances of his good purposes in time to come, they must know that sturdy foundation which is what Zechariah is really digging down for us to see, to get a hold of. It's a surprising and kind of jarring opening message. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying what? The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Here they are, under the oppressive and foreign Persian authority. They're living in poverty. They're trying to claw their way back from the consequences of their father's sins. It was the previous generation's sins that led to the exile. Angry with our father's sins? Really, we know. We're experiencing the aftermath of that. Important point, people's sins can deeply affect others. The next generation... Zechariah's opening does not at first appear encouraging. But he's not just trying to provide a, a pep talk to them. He's not coddling them. And it's not Zechariah's words. This is the word of the Lord. Three times in those opening three verses, we read, Thus says the Lord of hosts. As hard as the opening words are, it's a reminder to God's people, that the same God of covenant promise and covenant love is the God of covenant judgment. Angered over sin. He doesn't passively excuse sin. He's not indifferent to it. He's confronting it, and he is dealing with it. And it's not only their fathers. It's them. He's calling them to repentance. Verse 3. Thus say to them, declares the Lord, return to me, and I will return to you. It is a call for repentance. Now we might ask, repent of what? Repent from what? Well, a good clue is found in a biblical book that bears the name of one of Zechariah's contemporaries, and that is Haggai. That is the book just prior to Zechariah. So if you turn back just a few pages, you'll see Haggai, which is a prophet and book that is only two chapters uh, in length. If you were to read through Haggai, the central call in that book is for the people to get to work on the building efforts, the rebuilding efforts. If you turn back, Notice the time stamp in the first verse of Haggai. It says, in the second year of Darius, in what month? The sixth month. Second year of Darius, the sixth month. What's the opening of Zechariah? Eight, eight months of the second year. Haggai's word from the Lord comes only 60 days, two months prior to the word from Zechariah. So these are prophets who are contemporaries at exactly the same time. So we read uh, in Haggai 1, verse 2. Here's part of the message that is coming through to the people at this time. Haggai 1, 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people, God's people, say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, while this house 
lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but you have harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Two decades had passed from 538 BC and the initial return and rebuilding efforts, but little progress was seen. Outside pressure and opposition caused their efforts to simply fizzle out. There's numerous things that were discouraging and difficult in this period of time. One of them was that the city walls were damaged. In the ancient Near East, city walls were protection from invasion. To have no walls meant a serious vulnerability. Several decades later during Nehemiah's ministry, he would say in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17, you see the trouble we're in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let's build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. Of course, you and I know that it's much more than physical walls that protect the people of God. You think of Proverbs 25, 28. A man without restraint, a man whose heart is out of control is like a city broken into and left without walls. And that's part of Zachariah's message. Return to me, says the Lord. I am your walls. I am your protection. Where is the people's attention? They're focused on their own homes, their own lives, not that of the Lord's. Some people might call this the sin of normalcy. The sin of normalcy. The sin was not some heinous outward act, some sinful act of, of, of commission. It was really more what they were not doing. Shirking responsibility. They're investing in their own lives. They're managing their own demands and schedules, licking their wounds. Maybe they didn't feel they had the energy or the interest or the time for the Lord and his call. Can you relate to that? Isn't it hard enough at times to keep our heads above the water of normal, everyday life? Let alone to be someone striving to pray, striving to serve the body of Christ, striving to grow in humility and character and Christ-likeness, to demonstrate real care and love for others, applying one's gifts to serve the kingdom of ends. Return to me, repent. That is our daily calling, and that's our daily gift. That was or close to the heart of, of, of Martin Luther's call. If you read his 95 Thesis, the opening statement uh, is centering on repentance. He's pushing back against the Roman view of penitence. Repentance as mere outward action, outward act. Well, repentance does include outward act in our lives, but it begins from a broken and contrite heart. Repentance always begins with a broken and contrite heart before the Lord. Repentance, a turning again to the Lord. It is our daily calling and daily gift because when we turn to the Lord, we find something, and it's this. We find he was already turning toward us. When you turn to the Lord for the first time or again, you will find the Lord was already turning toward you. That's what comes through. Listen to the voice of God, Zechariah saying, saying. The voice is already speaking. His voice was speaking to his people. Turn to me. Return to me. That's a, that's a God who's initiating and turning toward his people. That's the kind of God that will serve and worship. That's the direction they were to face. 
the director of repentance. But then there's more. There's an old sin or error that they're being called to avoid. And it comes in verse 4 of the text. Verse 4. Don't be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Likelihood, the prophets say, Zechariah has in mind for Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, those whose ministry primarily are just prior to, to the fall of Jerusalem. If you survey their words, those prophets, you would be led to the conclusion about really two main categories of sins. One is idolatry. That big category of idolatry. Really the putting of something that is not God in his place. And the other is hypocrisy, which is really worship divorced from any serious commitment to the commandments of God. And so Jeremiah 7 says this, From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I had persistently sent all my servants and prophets to them day after day, yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, stiffen their neck. Worse than their fathers. Centuries and centuries he is summing up the attitude of God's people toward the word of the Lord. Our God indeed is a God of grace and mercy. He calls and he reconciles sinners to himself. He gives new hearts. He promises life forevermore through his sacrificial love. He provides. He reveals his will. He comforts. Countless are the ways that his grace is manifest. But he is also a God of righteousness and holiness and justice. And demands an accounting for sin. And the New Testament picture is essentially the same. Jesus warned his disciples not to fear men who could kill only the body, but to fear God, who after killing the body has the power to throw one into hell. Luke chapter 12. The most profound picture and expression of God's holiness and justice is indeed the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The cross is God's forgiving grace to us, but the cross makes no real sense without seeing in it the wrath and the judgment of God for my violence and my sin. So the Lord through Zechariah is really wanting his people to take a hard look at themselves. Not merely that they would have just a, a bit of improvement from their fathers, but in looking at themselves, they would then look to him who alone forgives, who alone sanctifies, who alone changes hearts, who alone is able to guide them in that work of restoration. Listen to a few words from St. Augustine. Augustine wrote this, You, Lord, turned me back towards myself, taking me from behind my own back where I had put myself all the time that I pre prefer not to see myself. And you set me there before my own face that I might see how vile I was, how twisted and unclean and spotted and ulcerous. I saw myself and I was horrified, but there was no way to flee from myself. And then listen to these words again to Augustine. Even now the fire is burning. The heat of the word is on. The fierce glow of the Holy Spirit. So for the time being, treat the scripture of God as the face of God. Melt in front of it. Repent when you hear all this about your sins. And when you repent, when you torment yourself under the heat of the word, when the tears also begin to flow, don't you find yourself rather like wax beginning to drip and flow down as if in tears? The likely repentance to which Zechariah was calling them is similar to that of Haggai's method. The work on their paneled houses 
It's not language suggesting luxury. They're living in poverty. It's more likely putting the finishing touches on their home while the health of the Lord lay in ruin. Again, it's what they were not doing. Haggai, is it a time for you yourself to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Consider your ways. You've sown much, but you're harvesting little. It's not merely how hard one is working in life, but what are they working at? What are they working for? What are we living for? They were being called to a new direction, repent of return. They're being called to avoid an old sin. Don't be like your fathers. And then a final thing, they're really being called to a timeless truth in which to find that. Verse 5 and 6. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your father? So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so has he dealt with us. So they repented. Who is the they? Some take they to be the generation who went into exile after receiving the judgment of God. They repented. But it seems more fitting in the context to see those who are repenting as the very ones to whom Zechariah is speaking. Those who had returned. For he says, don't be like your fathers. Who did not be. And the author is saying, those Zechariah is addressing did indeed repent. The timeless truth is this our fathers are God. Prophets, preachers, as effective or faithful as they might be, come and they go. There's only one lasting foundation, only one eternal and immovable foundation, and that is. The word of the Lord. His word. His threats and his judgments, they're never idle. His promises are absolutely sure. He said, but my words which I commanded, did they not overtake your father? Threats were left this morning with that word, overtake or arrest. His word is going to have its way. Sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting to the heart. Like rain, as they have been said, waters the earth bringing forth, so his word will not return in him. So the Lord through Zechariah is calling people to this work of restoration and rebuilding. That is what he is calling you and you and I to as well. It's what he calls every Christian to be a part of. Jesus had come, I will build my church. And he begins with his people. As we are living stones being built up into a spiritual house for God's glory. What a great and high calling it is to be a part of God's work of restoration of freedom. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would shape us uh, by it, that your Holy Spirit would have his way with us. Lord, we thank you that uh, through your Son, Jesus Christ, that uh, final work of restoration is taking place. Your kingdom inaugurated, advancing, and one day consummated. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would humble our hearts, that you would cause us to return again to you. We pray that your word, O oh Lord, would arrest our hearts that we would rest upon your grace in Christ. Lord, turn us for you with sincerity of heart, with joy and thanksgiving, 
Lord, help us to be a people who are uh, committed in our own individual lives, families, and the body of Christ uh, to your work and your kingdom. For this we pray with thanks in Jesus' name.